welcome to another episode of How to Be a Great Player. I'm answering a question today, and the question comes from C. Proust. I hope that's how you pronounce your surname, Mr. Proust, unless it's Prusser. Nonetheless, your question is, how do you go about building a better character for the party? Well, now that's a very interesting question, and I'm fairly certain that there's two lines of schools of thought on that particular question. The one is, you should create the character that you want to play for the game, regardless of what your fellow players are doing. And the other is, you should create a tightly knit group of players who complement one, one another, and that you have sat around the table and built these elite characters who literally will work very well together. Personally, I err on the side of saying, play the character that you want to play. However, having said that, and you can reference a whole bunch of videos that we've made earlier on in the series, you don't want to create the loner type of character that simply plays on their own and doesn't integrate with the rest of the group. So, if we look at a balanced approach, then we might look at both options. One of the very first things that I would look at, though, is... When you look at creating a character as part of a party, so you sit down as a group and you say, oh, all right, who wants to play the captain? Who wants to play the helmsman? Who wants to play the starfighter pilot? Who wants to play the warrior or the wizard or the priest? That's a great way to start so that you can all decide on the roles you're going to be taking. Sometimes you're going to get to a Canadian standoff, though, where you've got players going, well, I'll play anything. I don't mind. I don't have a choice. Uh, I don't really care. And everyone at the table, if they do that, then you just kind of go around in circles saying, well, I don't know, what do you want to play? I don't know, what do you want to play? Ultimately, there needs to be some kind of direction. And that might need to come from you. So decide what you want to play. Now, how do you decide what you want to play? Well, ultimately, in my opinion, you should go to looking at your character background. And we did a video on that called Seven Steps or Six Steps to Building a Better Character. And in that background, the career might start to suggest itself. The career, uh, the, the, the character type might start suggesting itself. If you've got a character who has had a particularly violent background, they might become a cleric because they want to prevent people from committing violence, or perhaps they become a warrior themselves so that they can commit more violence towards others. Either way, someone needs to take the lead. But once you've done that, you can then start to look at the benefits of creating a character that fits within the party. And some of those benefits are fairly obvious. You have a broader skill set. If you are playing an academic and someone else is playing a brawler, the academic brings all of the science skills, the brawler brings all of the martial skills. You have uh, inclusion in different types of, of activities. Your GM, your game master, is not restricted to only running one type of mission. They can make it a little bit broader and require different skills to solve the uh, adventure. Ultimately, this leads to perhaps a more interesting adventure for you. And of course, your survivability goes up. Now, a lot of modules, and if your game master likes to use modules as their way of playing the game, a lot of modules rely on parties being diverse and well-balanced. That is, you don't all play fighters, or you don't all play rogues, or you don't all play wizards. It actually requires that you have a nice mix so that you can overcome set missions and set obstacles within that pre-written module. If your game master, however, is a free-form game master, then, well, if you go to him and say, we're a party of five paladins, we worship different gods, he might step in and say, if you worship different gods, there could be a conflict that's going to arise, especially if your gods have divergent thoughts. If you're five paladins of the same order, well, then that's fantastic, because now you are a literally a champion god of a specific denomination, which allows for very specific missions, and missions that you wouldn't normally get with a more balanced party. So there are some advantages to all playing the same class or to play very similar classes. What if you're playing a Dungeons and Dragons game and you don't have any clerics, you don't have any wizards, you don't have any paladins? In other words, you are playing a game where there is almost no magic. Is it a disaster? Not at all. Not if your GM is a good GM. He should be able to adapt and change your missions so they're a lot more combat orientated, a lot more physical orientated, and a lot lighter on all those history checks and the magic arcana checks and, and those kind of skills. So when you're deciding on what kind of character to play, 
and you've decided to not necessarily sit around the table with the party. And then you get together for your gaming session and you realize that you have created the lawful good uh, cleric of the good god and everyone else are playing brutish thugs who are perhaps chaotic neutral or even perhaps um, a little bit lawful evil perhaps. And you're not going to fit in. What do you do? Do you throw your hands up in the air and say, well, stuff it. I'm going to play this character who is going to be at loggerheads with the party. It's going to make it very difficult for us to actually work together as a group. Our GM is going to have to force us to stay together because under normal circumstances, my character would simply leave. So should you just leave? As a player playing, a tr uh, playing true to your character, Perhaps that's the wisest thing to do. But this is a team sport. This is not an individual activity. So it makes sense to tailor your character to the party. But you've arrived, you've already printed out your character. How do you now change it to fit? And should you be the one changing or should it be everybody else? The answer, in my opinion, is to go back to your history. Look at your character's backstory and say, well, I've worked out this wonderful history and this is the turning points in their lives that caused them to want to become a lawful good paladin. Perhaps it's about adjusting it and saying, well, what if this last step didn't happen and instead of becoming a lawful good paladin, they became a paladin of a church that espouses some kind of apathy. Perhaps it's a church that gives out... Um, indulgences like the certain churches on this planet used to do in the Dark Ages. And so the paladin is not particularly good because, well, if he just brings back a hundred gold crowns, he can get an indulgence which absolves him from whatever sin he committed with this party of questionable ethics and morals. So sometimes it's about making one little tweak and the character still works, but now they work better with the party. I think when one looks at building a party and when one looks as a player in terms of how do you create this cohesive unit, you need to look at what kind of game you're expecting to play. So in a fantasy type of setting, whether it's Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder or um, Savage Lands or whatever the case might be, the type of game you're going to be playing depends on the rest of your players. If you know you've got a player who hates magic, don't not create a wizard, but also anticipate that the party is not going to go running off after every magical item that pops up. They're more likely to go on more, say, uh, combat type campaigns. At the same time, if your GM is someone who wants to run a high magic game, well, then maybe it makes sense to have access to that and to try and help your fellow player Create a character who hates magic, but begrudgingly uses it. So it's a give and take. You mod modify your character slightly, they modify theirs. And this kind of conversation so rarely happens. So, so often do I see players sitting around a table, not chatting, saying, well, this is my character. What's your character? How can they link together? Have they got a history with one another? Um, well, you've kind of gone with a whole bunch of sneaky skills and my sneak stuff is all penalized heavily because I wear full plate armor. Uh, maybe we should look at adjusting some stuff. Maybe my warrior shouldn't wear plate armor. Maybe he should wear leather. But at the same time, maybe instead of sneaking, you should be taking poison so that you can knock people out. So we're not sneaking past wake gods. We're sneaking past gods who are already drugged in the sleep. That kind of negotiation very seldom takes place, certainly around the tables that I play in. I think another thing to bear in mind is that modern day settings, sci-fi settings, the opposite is almost true of the fantasy setting or the post-apocalyptic setting. You almost want characters who are very similar. And I know I'm going to take some flack from this, but if you look at something like, say, a Star Trek setting, you want to create characters that are all in the same empire, and if one of them is a starship 
uh, operations officer, it would make sense if the rest were also involved in some kind of starship operations or a pilot or a science officer or a medical officer or whatever the case might be. It wouldn't make sense for them to be one is a Starfleet officer, another is a Romulan intelligence agent, and the third one is a Marquis rebel who has no regard for authority whatsoever. It's a very discordant group which might work for a once-off but it certainly shouldn't work for a long-term campaign, not unless your GM is being really, really pushed to the limit. On the other hand, if you create the crew of the starship doohickey, then you work together and you have a much better experience from it. So sometimes taking the same path is good. If, and this is really for all of you guys out there who love to play rogues, rogues work better in groups than they do with, say, fully armored knights and wizards hurling great big magic balls that involve a lot of verbal components. So a campaign all of rogues might work a little bit better uh, than the poor old rogue who's stuck with a bunch of people who really don't know the meaning of the word sneak. In short, I think the decision on whether you should change your character to suit the rest of the party or whether the rest of the party should change their characters to suit yours comes down to which of the group has created better characters that promise more adventure, that promise more story, and who can fairly easily tweak their character to fit better into the group. But the bottom line is that as a player, the GM is responsible for creating the story and possibly for creating the initial setting where you come together with your fellow players, where your characters meet and move on their first journey. It is, however, up to you as the player to make sure that the character that you've created has enough use, has enough skill, has enough uh, ethical or moral alignment, and also is likable enough that the rest of the characters in that party are going to want to work with them. There's no point in creating this wonderful character that really just won't work with the other characters that are sitting around the table with you. So bear that in mind next time you're creating a character, whether it's in isolation or sitting around a table, come together and talk about it before you start playing. That way you won't find three sessions into the campaign that your character just doesn't work with the rest of the group and you either have to kill them off and start again, which is a bit of a waste of gaming time in my experience, or you simply have to leave them to do it on their own. So. I hope this has been somewhat helpful in how to avoid bad character politics and how to create a character that really will work with a party. And I hope, Mr. Proust, that this has answered your question. Until then, hit the like button. If you want to see more of these, hit the subscribe button. And if you want your questions answered here, whether well or poorly or up to you, drop us a comment below. We will read them. I'll add them to the list and we will get through them. Until next time, happy playing.